Um, right, so yeah, thank you. Very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about data and representing data, so it's sort of going in a different direction. Um, but also how we can start thinking about that relationship between representing data illustratively and then thinking about what that means in terms of interpretation. So both both ways. And I'm also taking from something Kelvin said, and it's on one of the slides, there the, the three points, um, different types of illustrator in terms of narrative, um, I forgot the middle one, but the right was builder. And because I'm going to be talking about vegetation, I'm going to be talking about environments, and we can't build that. You know, you can't, you do not have a foundation to build from. So how do you do that? So I'm going to be talking about vegetation. You would have noticed also in all the talks, in one way or another, you can see vegetation quite often as backdrop, sometimes as part of the actual topic with, with the boats, um, but actually thinking about that point. And actually my starting point for this, or our starting point for this, goes back a terrifying 22 years to TAG in Oxford, um, where we're debating some of the digital approaches um, to, to uh, things like, uh, well, just archaeology generally. And in that session, later published, we would, what we were trying to approach was trying to understand reconstruction as a way of integrating vegetation, what that would do in terms of the visual narrative of approaching a site. In this case, an Iron Age marsh fort, in some ways that doesn't matter. We were thinking about visibility, uh, we're thinking about view shows, we're thinking about how do, do different uh, arrangements of trees based on pollen evidence, based on water table data, how does that impact on that experience as you move through a landscape? Um, but the reason we were doing that, the reason we are doing that was because, you know, the context of the time, you know, phenomenology was a big thing. Um, we were taken by um, you know, uh, Bender Hamilton Tilly's approach to the, the idea of framing the landscape. You know, what happens when you look out, you know, what's, what's that experience of being in the landscape? You know, so that was the territory we're working on uh, and working with. And of course, this side of illustration or that sort of relationship between trying to understand, well, what happens if you put trees in that landscape? How does it change that interpretation? It's not just about people, it's about, it's all, all together. It's not, trees are not just backdrop to everything else. Um, and we see as we go through time, and this is slightly chronological, um, things like the Winter Possum and Long paper, which um, in my world is quite a famous uh, moment, really. Um, but actually looking at uh, Kilmartin and Glen, or, or sites within Kilmartin and Glen, and seeing that relationship between what happens if you add vegetation to a landscape? How does it change interpretation? Even if you don't have particularly robust data for a particular site, what happens in terms of maximum, minimum? How does, it, how does it work with some of the interpretation of these sites? How does that actually affect? You know, the vegetation is important within these areas. But the problem comes down to this, I think. Um, that's a pollen diagram. How do you go from a pollen diagram to something which makes sense to an illustration to that experience? And there's a load of problems. It's not just a case of you've got abstract to a different sort of abstract. Um, the problem comes down to actually, unless you know what you're looking at, and I'm not one of those people, um, unless you know what you're looking at in terms of how much pollen does a particular species produce? How far does that blow? How much does it move? It's not a case of just proportions. It's a case of actually understanding all that evidence. And it's interesting talking to pollenologist colleagues, um, they were both, you know, both in this paper, where they talk about actually looking at a pollen diagram, they can sort of see it. They can sort of, they, they have a sense of it. I'm not entirely, this imagination, you can sort of see what that landscape is. But how do you communicate that? How do you actually tell other people what that's like and, and what the implications are of that? So how do you go from this abstract to something like this? Um, how do you make sure that that is not just backdrop in terms of environment? How, you know, going back to Winter Possum and Long, that relationship with interpretation. The other thing, very similar slide, but a different point I want to make is that actually as you move through, particularly in certain circles of illustration, um, there's this increased use of game engines. The idea of using you know, put, putting environments into that sort of 3D environment um, is a very convenient way of, way of um, reconstructing archaeological sites. But what becomes very interesting, I think, to my mind, is you suddenly have that um, experiential kind of, we're going back to phenomenology in many ways, we're, we're putting people back in that landscape. You also have interactivity. It's not, not a still image. You, know, you, you actually have that ability. You can't hide a tree behind something because you can go find out what that tree is. So suddenly this opens up all sorts of questions in terms of data validity, but also um, in terms of that, that phenomenological kind of approach. And I think it's really interesting because many of the actual game sort of software which is used is first person shooters, um, often trying to hide the gun so it doesn't look that, that weird. Um, but I think that's a really interesting return back to that idea of embodying landscape, but also the importance of getting the vegetation correct. So how do you do that? How do you actually get the something which is rigorous, testable, 
understanding the vegetation. We've been saying for, for years, you don't know where a tree is, but you can get close. One of the ways we can get close to this is using something like MSA, multi-scenario approach to pollen modeling. This is basically a translation from that abstract pollen diagram to land cover. But not just one sort of land cover, multiple versions, multiple possible scenarios. So the way it works is you, you start off with um, what you know from the pollen data for a particular period. Uh, what you know in terms of the things which influence how plants grow, where they grow, so geology, you know, um, drift geology, um, water, slope, etc., etc. You You have the input variables in terms of where do, what do you know about where certain plants grow? What are the rules that dictate it? And then from that, the computer generates multiple scenarios, you know, hundreds of them, of different possibilities which can come from that. And then you can test it against other cores and you can start getting some sense of rigor to the process. You can understand statistically what's more likely, what's less likely, where's the field in terms of what, what might exist. So you end up with something which is land cover. Okay, it's another abstraction, it's another representation of data and it's statistical, but we're getting closer. So, and it's great because in, uh, in this study, it's some set, in some set levels, which I'll come back onto in a bit, um, you start looking at all sorts of questions, like actually what, you've got the pollen data, what does that mean in terms of clearance and openness and that sort of thing changing? What does that mean in terms of, you know, almost the other biodiversity, the things that you don't see in the pollen record? Um, yeah, opening up those sorts of questions. But there's, I've kind of started off with that idea of phenomenology and the idea of the experienced landscape. The thing here is it's different questions, different scales, you're looking at, huge area of the Somerset levels. It's different scales. And the reason it's different scales is because the input data for this, you know, it's the pollen and so on, but it's done generally on sort of 50 meter grid. It's on quite a low resolution. You're using data as the input variables which are gonna tell you where an older tree can grow or some other species can grow. It's gonna be based upon geology maps and modern data essentially. So there's, prob there's problems. If we wanna go from that to something which is much more about how the landscape is experienced and start addressing those sorts of questions in terms of what is it like to embody and experience a landscape. Um, that FPS, that first person sort of video game kind of experience of the world with rigor and testability, how do we do it? So we've been working and in this true tra tag tradition of a work in progress, um, we've been working with data, we're revisiting areas where we have data already existing because of other work. So this is some work which, which I did with Ben at the back um, a decade ago or so, where we're trying to model the spread of wetlands in a peat bog. The geology map just shows a big area of peat, I mean, that's, that's what it is, that's modern. Um, but actually trying to use a variety of radiocarbon dating and, and so on and so forth, environmental data, um, modeling where wetlands start, how they spread. So this mosaic of different types of wetlands through time. So you suddenly have this much more sort of detailed understanding. So we go back to the MSA, that modeling approach. We can now use this sort of data to then inform for particular time periods, those driving factors which are gonna influence that sort of, that nuance understanding of data. So we can go and we can look at you know, the wide area and at the scale of LIDAR. We're talking about meter resolution now rather than 50. Uh, we're talking about detail of how we know the different sorts of environments are, you know, the, the different influencing factors for those different environments are gonna change through time. So again, this is very abstract, but this is the basis which then is gonna allow us, and like I said, in the tag tradition, you're not gonna see that, um, but this is what's gonna inform that process where you suddenly you can actually have that three, you can have that video game kind of experience of, of a landscape. We can put people back in those landscapes, you can experience it, um, but also we know that there's not only one possibility of the past, but we can get close to it and we can look at variations. So in conclusion, I think a number of things we can pull out of that. First one is just the importance of robust reconstruction and the importance of, um, bringing the vegetation to the foreground. It's, yeah, it, I, I'm also reminded of um, something John Coles wrote, I, I think it's something that's normally attributed that way, which was basically everything in the past, and by that meaning sort of prehistory was, or 95% of everything was organic. Everything made out of those trees. Everything's made out of the stuff which we are putting into the backdrop. It's really important. Um, I think the second thing is as, as we start moving to that sort of, or as we are already doing, commonly using that sort of FPS, that, that, that first person shooter game engine kind of in interactive environment, then yeah, we, we are starting to work back into, we're sort of going back a few decades as well in terms of what we're thinking. It's a really interesting time. Um, but if we're gonna do that, that requires a very, very specific resolution. 
It also requires that, you know, that inter interplay with the first part, that understanding the robust nature of what we have. And finally, it's the, we need to understand our data. It's very easy, and I, I can't remember which speaker mentioned this, but yeah, the, the, the old adage that as soon as you, the, the more fidelity you have with an image, the more believable it is. Um, we need to have that relationship and keep on revisiting. And this is why I really like the idea of having multiple possible paths and demonstrating that. Um, and of course, you might wonder if, you, if, if you're looking at the picture tool, well, there's quite odd pictures. They don't make any sense in terms of what I'm saying. And that's, that's not a complete accident. Um, it, but it's, it's, a, it's a reminder that actually, once, if we can start getting those environments, we can start thinking about actually how do you move through them? Um, the first picture is just from, from earlier on uh, in terms of style car. It's the idea that actually in a, in a game engine, those interactions, you're looking at the sky, you're not looking at your feet. And if you walk through a wetland, you're falling over if you do that. So thinking about how does that work in terms of trying to map experience in these sorts of environments. But also these two, just the idea of different people, different uses, different backgrounds, mean that your understanding of those different environments are different. So how are we going to start bringing that in? But before we can start all that, we need the rig, we need to be robust. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Stop making